Well, good morning, College Heights. Would you please stand and join us in worship this morning? Remember those walls that we called sin and shame? They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death? You can go and have a seat and turn your attention to the baptistry as we celebrate new life. Hello, everyone. This is Cambry Rogers. And for the past couple weeks, we've talked, I'm going to cry. Sorry. We've talked about what it looks like for Cambry to dedicate her life to following Jesus, and Cambry is ready to do that, and she wanted to do it in front of our church family, so I, <laughs> so Cambry, I have a qu couple questions, are you ready? Okay, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God? Yes. 
Good job. Okay, and then the second one is you accept him as your Lord and Savior. Are you sure he's on? Welcome you, and this is a great way to start. Thank you for coming to worship with us today. If you're a guest with us, my name is Rick Bushnell, and it's so good to, to welcome you. And I'd like to encourage you to uh, uh, text in the word welcome to the phone number that you're going to see here on the screen. That's kind of the way that you can make a connection with us, and we can make a connection with you. And uh, so we'd like to encourage you to do that today. Uh, this is going to be a, a day that I'm going to look forward so much to seeing new births, uh, people coming into the kingdom of God, and that's already happened here uh, this morning, so it's so good to do that. Uh, I'm also looking forward to the time when we can uh, read the Word of God and, and hear a encouraging message, especially for uh, this time of the year, and that's going to happen today also. I'm also looking forward to the fact that we're going to be praying together today and and. Uh, we're going to have prayer stations where you can go and pray with people, and I look forward to our time to uh, pray together. And a matter of fact, a new thing that we're doing here that we've been introducing the last couple of weeks is on the communion tables. We have the prayer cards there because not only do our, our prayer team want to pray with you and elders here, but our staff would like to pray for you during the week. And so by filling out one of these prayer cards, you can either drop it in the uh, giving stations at the back or bring it up to the prayer station with you and our, our volunteers will make sure that the staff get those prayer cards so they can even be praying uh, for you during the week. Another thing that I'm looking forward to today, and especially this time of year, it's a special blessing to be involved in giving here at College Heights because this is the time of the year that Ramadan season happens. And the Muslims in our community and around the world, this is a time when they are most open to the gospel because at Ramadan, it's a specific time where they're asking God to reveal himself to them. This opens the door many times. This is when the, the ground is the most fertile for us to share the gospel. Our global mission partners tell us that because of the prayers that are happening here in the States, God is doing incredible things this particular time of the year. And there's lots of stories about Muslims coming to them and saying, I had a dream, Jesus Christ, what, what is this? What's going on here? God is just working and doing incredible things, and we can be a part of that through generous giving, but also a part of that through our prayers. Uh, matter of fact, we have a, an incredible opportunity coming up on April the 7th, because after church on April the 7th, we're going to have a Ramadan awareness prayer event. We'll have an opportunity for you to get to know our workers that are out on the field working with Muslims right here today, be able to hear some of the incredible things that are happening uh, around the world, how God is working. Uh, there's going to be a meal. As a matter of fact, they're suggesting if you want to bring a side dish that day, you can go to chjoplin.org slash events and look for the Ramadan prayer lunch event there. And uh, so uh, this would just be an incredible time for you. We also have prayer guides available out here in the atrium that helps you to know what to pray for, and how to pray uh, for this big event. So please pick up one of those. Take it home with you so you can be praying. Well, this is the beginning of Holy Week. Uh, this is actually Palm Sunday and the beginning of Holy Week. And so our staff has made available for all of us uh, a devotion site, a website. You can go to chjoplin.org slash events. And they have daily devotions every day this week leading up to, uh, to Easter Sunday. And talking about Easter Sunday, we've been trying to let you know the, uh, the uh, Good Friday services, the times of those two services, 12.15, 6.15 on Friday. That'll be to help the hurting. Sometimes you're the only one that can help the hurting. Father, we know that you have been weary. You know what it is to hurt. You know what it is to be weary. And Father, we're so grateful today that you turn your face toward the hurting and the weary, and you listen to them. Father, I know there's some here today that are, have strongholds in their lives that they're trying to overcome, and Father, you destroy strongholds. And so we praise you for that today. We thank you 
for that today. And we thank you that even at times when we slip, when we go back, that your face is always turned toward us. You're always encouraging, and you welcome us back. You seek us. You look for us, and we thank you for that today as well. Father, today we're just going to rejoice in the incredible things that you've done for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. It's the most wonderful time of the year. I'm not talking about Christmas. I'm talking about March Madness. <laughs> How's your bracket looking? Okay. Not, not, a, not a lot of upsets yet, so Brackett's probably still doing okay, but there are three one seeds playing today, so there's still a possibility. I love March Madness because of the Cinderella stories. I, I, love, I love a good underdog story. I, I love watching brackets get busted, shattered into dozens of little pieces. But I also love seeing dreams come true. But for every team that has their dream come true, there are 63 teams, or I guess you could say 67 teams, that have their dreams shattered. What's worse than, than having your bracket busted, what's worse than having your, your bracket shattered, is when it feels like your life is being shattered into dozens of little pieces. And I wonder if you've ever felt that way. I wonder if you've ever felt like life was shattering into a handful of little pieces. We, we practiced this in the rehearsal and it went better than that, I promise you. Maybe you remember the nursery rhyme. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Maybe you came into church today feeling a little bit like Humpty Dumpty. Feeling like your life has been shattered into a bunch of little pieces. And no matter how much you grab the spiritual super glue and try to put those pieces back together, it just doesn't feel like you can do that. Maybe you, you recently relocated. Your, your mom, your dad got a new job and so you're entering into a new school system. And you had to leave behind all of, those, all of those friends you had ever known since kindergarten, those close friends that you had built relationships with over years and years. And this year, in a new school district, in a new place, it's been difficult. It's been challenging. You felt like nobody understands you. You felt like you're all alone. And maybe it feels like your life... is shattering into dozens of little pieces. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put your life back together again. Maybe it's your marriage. It seems like all you ever do now is fight. In the past, you were able to work through it, but now it just seems like you get up in the morning and you fight. You get home from work and you fight. You try to go on a date, but in the car on the way there, you fight. And as you think about the status of your marriage, you can't help but feel like your life is shattering into dozens of little pieces. Maybe it's death. Someone in your family recently passed away. Someone who was like a rock for your family. The one person you felt understood you. The one person you felt you could turn to when, when nobody else understood, but now they're gone. And the grief of that loss feels like it has left your life shattered in dozens of little pieces. And all the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put your life back together again. Jesus encountered a man whose life had been shattered into dozens of little pieces. 
He had been born blind. He was marginalized. He was an outcast. He was ostracized by society on the fringes of culture. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put his life back together again. But then one day, the king himself, King Jesus, showed up. He spat on the ground, made some mud with his fingers, and then rubbed them on his eyes. It's the weirdest miracle in all of the Gospels. And yet, the man could then see. Jesus stooped down, and he gathered up the pieces of this man's shattered life, and he put him back together again. Sort of. At least temporarily. Because there were some Jewish religious leaders there that day who didn't approve of Jesus' method. Because in their culture, doing something like that on the Sabbath, which is when the miracle took place, was considered work. They considered making mud to be a form of work, which was a violation of Sabbath law. And so they begin discussing how they're going to respond to this. They think, couldn't Jesus have just waited one more day? I mean, the guy had been blind for decades. What's one more day going to hurt? Just withhold doing good for one more day, Jesus. And so their conclusion was to re-shatter this man's life by kicking him out of the synagogue. Which may not seem like a big deal to you and me, but in their Jewish culture, being kicked out of the synagogue not only means you are a religious outcast, you're also a social outcast, you're unemployable, and it's possible that his own family had to distance themselves from him in order to avoid stigma and shame. And it's in this context that Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. If you're following along, we're going to be in John 10 today. You can go ahead and turn there in your Bible, John chapter 10. In this series, we've been looking at these I am statements that Jesus makes in the gospel of John. We've looked at two of them already. Jesus uh, claims to be the bread of life, the one who sustains us. He claims to be the light of the world, the one who, who, who brings light into the darkness in us and around us. Today, though, we're going to look at the next two I am statements, where Jesus declares to be the gate or the door and the good shepherd. And from these two I am statements, Jesus reveals three different techniques that he, the good shepherd, uses to stoop down and gather up the shattered pieces of our lives and put our lives back together again. Here's technique number one that Jesus uses. The good shepherd calls for shattered lives. He, he extends his voice, hoping that we recognize his voice, that we listen, and that we follow him. Notice what Jesus says, John chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. He says, Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him, because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him, because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. The good shepherd calls out to his sheep. Let me make a couple observations in the five verses that we just looked at. Observation number one, notice the contrast. Notice the contrast between the good shepherd and the thief. The thief, he, he climbs in looking for some deceptive way when, when nobody is looking, intending to do harm to the sheep. But Jesus, the good shepherd, doesn't climb in through some secretive method. No, he goes right through the front door. Jesus is painting the picture of first century Jewish life in a small village. In a small village, most families didn't own a large number of sheep. Each family might have owned a handful of sheep. And so they would partner together with a number of different families in their small village, and together they would form one flock. And, and they would have maybe a family servant who would keep watch over the flock in maybe a courtyard of one of the homes. And first thing in the morning, whenever the shepherd would show up, maybe somebody who was hired by the family, maybe it was one of the young children of the family, but whenever that shepherd showed up, the gatekeeper would open up the door and let them in because they were known, they were trusted. And the shepherd would then just call the names of the sheep, expecting that 
each sheep would hear the voice, would listen, and would respond and follow the shepherd. Observation number two, notice the repetition of the word voice three times in those five verses. Verse three, Jesus said the sheep listen to his voice. In verse four, because they know his voice. At the end of verse five, they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Our good shepherd stoops down and he gathers up the the pieces of our shattered lives. And the first way that he does that is by simply calling out to us trusting that we recognize his voice, trusting that we, that we know who it is who's calling out to us and we follow him. So let me just ask the obvious question. How well are we doing that, church? How well are we listening to the voice of Jesus? How well are we responding when he calls to us to follow him? Because he's not the only voice who's trying to get our attention. There are a number of different voices trying to compete for our attention, our affection, our devotion, our allegiance, who are trying to distract us from the voice of the Good Shepherd. I heard a story of a teacher who decided that she was going to run a little experiment with one of her classes. And so one day her her students showed up in the classroom. And when the bell rang, she told all of them, take out your phone. Turn it off of silent or off of vibrate and and turn the ringer on. Turn all your notifications on. Don't have it on. Do not disturb. We want you to be disturbed today. And on the board, she had this piece of paper with category labels. Text messages, phone calls, emails, a bunch of different social media platforms. And then she gave them these instructions. Anytime you receive a notification, I want you to take your phone out, look at it, See what category it falls under, walk to the board, and draw a tally mark underneath the appropriate tally. And here are the results of one class. About 20 students, one hour, every single tally mark that you see represents a distraction. We live in a culture that is trying to distract us, that is vying for our attention and our affection. Now, the ones that you see up there, those those distractions, they're not necessarily evil. They don't have bad intentions. They're not bad shepherds who who are out to destroy us or ruin us. But there are some voices that are. There are some false shepherds out there who want nothing better than to distract our attention away from the good shepherd and do us harm. Let's talk about some of those voices that we might be tempted to listen to. One voice that we may be tempted to listen to is the voice of disapproval. And some of you, you've been listening to the voice of disapproval all your life. You heard it from your parents growing up. You'll never be good enough. You heard it from your teachers You'll never be smart enough. You heard it from your coaches. You'll never be athletic enough. Now you hear it from your bosses. You can't do anything right. And you've been listening to the voice of disapproval for so long that now it feels like your life is shattering into dozens of little pieces. Others of you, it's, it's not the voice of disapproval that you listen to. It's the voice of fear. Fear that says, you know you're going to end up all alone. You know nobody likes you. It doesn't matter how hard you try, you're going to fail at this. It doesn't matter what this is, you're going to fail. School, fail. Sports, fail. Friendships, fail. Dating, fail. Marriage, fail. Job, fail. And you've been listening to the voice of fear whispering in your ear for so long that now it feels like your life is shattering into dozens of little pieces. For others, though, it's the voice of pressure. 
pressure that's saying, hey, everybody else is doing it. If you loved me, you would. If you're gonna pass this class, you're gonna have to cheat. Pressure that tells you you've gotta succeed, you've gotta accomplish more, you've gotta be better. And you've been listening to the voice of pressure for so long that it feels like your life is shattering into dozens of little pieces. For others though, it's the voice of greed. Greed that is never satisfied. Greed that is always wanting more. More pleasure, more satisfaction, more money, more fame, more accolades, more accomplishment. No matter what you have, it's just never enough. And so you're on this endless pursuit for more and it's exhausting. And the more that you listen to the voice of greed, the more it feels like your life is shattering into dozens of little pieces. And so Jesus is leaning in and he's saying, stop listening to these other voices. Stop listening to all the false shepherds out there who are bringing you down, who are shattering your life into dozens of little pieces. And instead, listen to the voice of your good shepherd, the one who calls out, asking you to come follow him. That's the first technique that our good shepherd uses. He simply calls to us. The second technique that our good shepherd uses, the good shepherd provides for shattered lives. For those of us whose, whose lives have been broken and shattered, we need somebody to care for them. And Jesus provides the care that our shattered lives need. And it's here that we see the first of two I am statements Jesus makes in this passage, where he calls himself the gate or the door. Look with me, starting in verse 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus, our good shepherd, provides for shattered lives. And in, in these verses, we see three ways that he provides. First, he provides safety. The continued image is still the image of a shepherd out kind of in a field. And at nighttime, whenever it was time to, to relax, he would find an enclosure, often made out of stone, sometimes on a hillside or, or kind of on the edge of a cave. And he would lead the shepherd into that, that fold, into that pen. But there was a small opening at the front of this enclosure. The only way in or out of the pen was through that opening. And at nighttime, the shepherd, he or she, would lay down at the opening. They would become the gate or the door, effectively providing safety for the sheep that are inside the pen. It's the shepherd's way of saying, if you want to get to my sheep, you got to go through me. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He looks at you and me in his sheep pen, and he looks at anybody who would be out to, to steal from us, to kill, to destroy us, the enemy who wants to take away from us. And he says, if you want them, you got to get through me. He provides the safety and protection that our life needs. But that's not the only way that he provides. He provides safety, but secondly, he provides salvation. The only way into the pen is through the gate, is through the door. The only way in is through Jesus. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you've, you've seen a couple of videos from some of our global partners who are serving in predominantly Muslim contexts. And you've heard them describe how, how the, the Muslim context is kind of a point-based system where if they do enough good, they hope they can win enough favor from God that in, in their religion... They can kind of earn their way into heaven. And we as Christians look at a context like that and we think, man, I'm so glad that's not how Christianity operates. And yet, many of us practically live the same way. That we think, if I can just check the spiritual boxes, I read my Bible, I pray, I go to church, I tithe, I serve, I volunteer, and I'm in a small group. If I can just check enough spiritual boxes, maybe I'll win God's favor. Maybe I'll do enough to get in. Friends, that's not how it works. 
You can't get in based on your, your hard work. You can't get in based on your good deeds. Jesus is the only way in. He is the gate. He's the doorway into the pen. The one and only way. He provides salvation for us. And if you're here today and, and you've never made the decision to follow Jesus for the first time, our prayer team's going to be up at the platforms later on in the service, and they would love to talk with you about what it means to follow him, for, for him to be the way into salvation. We'll talk more about that in a few weeks later as we continue in this series. He provides safety. He provides salvation. Third way that he provides, he provides an abundance. The end of verse 10, I read from the NIV, uh, it reads, that we may have life to the full. Some translations say life in abundance or abundant life. Jesus wants you and I to have an abundant life. But there is an enemy out there who does not. There is a thief who wants nothing more than to take away from you, to steal, to kill, to destroy. Easter's coming up next week and it reminds me of a story I heard of a man named Joby Poole in the UK. He was arrested a year or two ago for stealing a semi-trailer full of Cadbury cream eggs. You know what I'm talking about? These Easter-themed eggs with the cream inside. I don't know what he was going to do with all of these Cadbury cream eggs, but there were 200,000 Cadbury cream eggs in this trailer. The estimated value of these eggs, $37,000. Police said their value was extravagant. <laughs> Little dad humor for you. No? Okay. That's what a thief does. They look for an opportunity. Anything they can do to take away. And that's what our enemy does. Our enemy, the devil, looks for, looks for an opening, a crack, some way to get in and steal from you. The enemy wants to steal your dignity wants to steal your sense of self-worth or value, wants to steal your identity. Friends, our enemy wants to steal your joy, wants to steal your peace, wants to steal your, your hope, wants to steal your gratitude, wants to steal all, all meaning and purpose in your life. But our good shepherd, he doesn't want to take from you. He doesn't want to steal from you. He wants to give to you. He wants to give you life in abundance. And that phrase, abundant life, it refers to the future, he wants you to live abundantly with him forever in all of eternity. But friends, that phrase, abundant life, it also refers to the here and now. He wants you to live abundantly right now. He wants you to have an abundance of joy right now. An abundance of hope right now. An abundance of peace right now. An abundance of gratitude and generosity right here and right now. An abundance of meaning and purpose right here and right now. And so he offers you life and life abundantly, a life that is overflowingly abundant in so many ways. He provides for us. He provides safety and salvation and abundance. That's the second technique. So far, we've seen that our good shepherd, he calls out to shattered lives and he provides for shattered lives. But there's a third technique that our good shepherd uses to scoop down and pick up the pieces of our shattered lives. Our good shepherd sacrifices for shattered lives. He lays down his life on our behalf. Notice how frequently Jesus makes mention of laying down his life in verses 11 through 18. It's a longer portion. Follow along with me as I read verses 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. That's the second I am statement in our passage. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the, sh is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life 
only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Four times in those eight verses, Jesus refers to laying down his life. In verse 11, the shepherd lays down his life. Verse 14, I lay, or 15, I lay down my life. Verse 17, that I lay down my life. Verse 18, but I lay it down of my own accord. Our good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And this is such a contrast to everything else that we see. In the Old Testament, the sheep laid down their lives for the sins of the shepherds. But our good shepherd lays down his life for the sins of the sheep. This runs contrast to the thieves and the robbers. They want to kill the sheep, but the good shepherd is killed for the sheep. It runs counter to the hired hand in verse 12 and 13. When danger comes, the hired hand runs away, but our good shepherd runs toward the danger. He lays down his life for those that he loves. Even for those who aren't part of his his flock at the time. That's what verse 16 means. And that would include you and me. He lays down his life for all potential sheep because of his great love. Reminds me of a story I heard of a mother going on a journey, South Wales in the UK. This was several, several decades ago. She was carrying her infant son in her arms, traveling up a hillside. Out of nowhere, a blizzard came and she got stuck, realized she wasn't gonna make it to her destination. Sure enough, she didn't. After the blizzard conditions disappeared, a search party was sent out. They found her body lying on a hillside. She had removed her outer garments, wrapped them around her baby, and then hovered over the baby to protect him. And when they they unwrapped him, there was the baby alive and well. She had sacrificed her life for the one that she loved dearly. This Friday is Good Friday. And we call it Good Friday because one Friday, 2000 years ago, our good shepherd removed his outer garments And he took his own journey up on a hillside. And there he was crucified, laying down his life voluntarily for you and me. Our text says he laid it down of his own accord. Nobody made him do it. He offered his life voluntarily. He gave up his freedom. He gave his freedom to the soldiers. He gave his head to the crown of thorns. He gave his back to the rods. He gave his body to the flogging. He gave his hands and his feet to the nails. He gave his hope to a criminal crucified next to him. He gave his forgiveness to a mocking crowd. He gave his spirit to the father. He gave his side to the spear. And he gave his life for his sheep. You may have walked in to this Easter season feeling like your life has been shattered into dozens of tiny little pieces. And no matter how desperately you've tried to to scoop down and, and put the pieces back together, you've used your spiritual super glue, but it's not been working. No matter how much you try to pick the pieces up and put them back together, you can't do it. But this text tells us there is one who can. We have a good shepherd who calls out to us. So listen to his voice. We have a good shepherd who provides for us. So trust his provision. And we have a good shepherd who sacrifices, who lays down his life. And in this text, we see exactly how it is that our good shepherd picks up the pieces of our shattered life. This text reveals to us that the good shepherd shatters his life to pick up the pieces of our shattered lives.
you're ready, if you want to stand, we're going to respond through worshiping, um, through singing together. That day, the sun when he prayed in the garden, accepted the will of the Father. And he chose the cross that day. That day, the sins of the world unaccounted. The one who the prophets had spoken chose the cross that day. His body was broken. Jesus Christ has overcome. Let's proclaim it.
Jesus made a way. Father, we love you. We worship you this morning. We thank you for sending your son to die on a cross for us. Father, may our voices be a worship to you this morning. May they be praise and declaration of that truth. We love you, and we thank you so much for who you are. Amen. I want to take a moment to invite our prayer team to go ahead and come up. Um, it cannot escape our mind that Jesus was not surprised by the cross. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't something that wasn't known. In fact, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he, he sat with his best friends, 12 men who will change the world, but not really. He's going to change the world. And, and he, in, he invited them in that moment to break bread, to drink wine. And he told them that he was going to die. And he reminded them that they should have this meal to remember this. And so the early church from the very beginning, they met together on the first day of the week and they broke bread and they prayed and they shared. They fellowshiped. And we invite you to join in that meal. The table is set. The bread and the juice are here. Find someone today. And pray with them. Fellowship with them. We invite you to come and break bread with us.
Well, let's end on a praise note. God is good. He is kind. And he is very, very real. Amen. Amen. Let's worship. 
I'm gonna need you to clap with me, okay?